All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out, and thank you to our friends online uh, or watching the recording. Um, so I'm Michael Carroll, one of the faculty directors of the program on information justice and intellectual property. Um, and we're thrilled to host uh, Rebecca Giblin, uh, a good friend and uh, someone I haven't gotten to see in a few years. So thank you for coming to town and <laughs> glad you had, could fit us into your schedule. Um, Rebecca is, uh, uh, has been working on a variety of uh, copyright issues and the intersection between copyright and, and new technologies. Uh, she's an ARC Future Fellow, uh, leading an inter interdisciplinary teams to build evidence about how intellectual property arrangements and other regulations actually work in practice. So we're going to hear a little bit more and hopefully during Q&A have a chance to really talk about, um, about both theory and practice. Um, her Future Fellowship project focuses on fuller protection of authorship as a distinct from ownership might actually create uh, opportunities for copyright reform. Um, and Rebecca is a very bottom line person. Great if they have copyright, but how do authors get paid uh, is, is part of what we're going to hear about tonight. Um, and so without further ado, could we please welcome Rebecca Giblin. Thanks everyone for coming out. I know that it's a beautiful night out there and maybe you would rather be at happy hour somewhere. So I really appreciate it. Um, I think that description of me as a very bottom line person is something I'm going to put on my CV. I think that's about right. Uh, so let me get straight into it. We all know what a zero sum game is. It's one where one party's gain precisely equals the other party's loss. So if we've ever played a game of poker and our friend has carted off all of the money of everybody else, we know we've played a zero sum game. In non zero sum games, the players' wins and losses don't have to actually cancel each other out. Copyright is a non-zero-sum game. So a change in the scope of rights can mean that there are gains to one party or multiple parties that are much more than the losses to others. But very often what we see is that copyright debates are set up as being about creators versus users. And that framing misdirects us about what's at stake here. It treats copyright as zero-sum, it ignores the symbiotic relationship between creation and use. And it conflates the interests of copyright creators with the interests of copyright owners. But perhaps more importantly, it distracts us from the questions that we should be asking, which are how well are current approaches to copyright actually achieving their aims? Copyright is about incentives and rewards. We award copyright to incentivize the initial creation of works, and we also want to incentivize their ongoing, ongoing access to them. But these aren't aims in and of themselves, of course. We do that in order to achieve the broader social benefits that come from access to knowledge and culture. So they can more properly be described as access aims. And then on top of that, we award copyright to reward creators. And this aim isn't in pursuit of any particular utilitarian purpose, although it might have the happy side effect of enabling creators to make more of the stuff that we like. But we do it because it's right and just to do so. It's a recognition that creators have moral claims that arise from those contributions of personality and labor. And for those of you who are sitting there going, oh, this sounds suspiciously continental, uh, Peter Yazzie, Jane Ginsburg, other terrific US scholars have done great work showing that this rewards motivation applies here as well, even if sometimes people pretend that that's not what they're doing. So authors' rewards claims have power. And that's why the rhetoric in favor of broader and longer copyrights and against new exceptions invariably puts authors at the forefront. You rarely hear claims grounded in the rights of investors to maximize their profits. Instead, authors' interests are put out front, often in service to investors' interests, because the validity of those claims make them powerful and effective. But the fact that rewarding creators is fundamental to the function and legitimacy of a copyright system 
doesn't mean we should just mindlessly expand it. It means that we need to pay much more careful attention to how we allocate copyrights, incentives, and rewards. Right now, they tend to get mixed together. We talk about what investors need and what authors deserve without separating those two things out. So think of the red liquid as the incentives component and the blue liquid as the rewards component. We end up right now with them effectively merged. But we need to distinguish them because they are actually different. Crucially, we don't mind who gets copyrights incentive component. We just want to get the, produced, the works produced and available. But we do care who gets copyrights rewards component. That's justifiable only for the author themselves. So that's not to say that cultural investors are not valid and important. Right? Of course they are. It's simply to say that authors' interests and investors' interests are different and that they need to be satisfied in different ways. So we have to demerge. We have to conceptually separate out this red bit, the incentive component that can go to anyone, from the blue bit or the rewards component which is justifiable only for creators themselves. And if you're gonna remember one thing from my talk today, let it be that. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do in my time today is spend a little bit, uh, a few minutes, okay, quite a few minutes, talking through how well copyright is achieving its core aims. And then I'm gonna put forward an alternative bargain for you to chew on. One that is consistent with the Byrne and Tripp's copyright treaties that would maintain incentives for creators and investors, but that would also generate new revenue for creators and free up works for lots more access. So let's start with copyright's first aim, incentivizing the creation of new works. Once we separate out copyright's rewards component like we just did, this comes into focus as a purely economic aim. And so we can figure out what we need to grant in order to incentivize the creation of new works by taking into account known factors like rates of cultural depreciation and the time value of money. The time value of money simply recognizes that a dollar you receive today is worth more than a dollar you receive tomorrow and much, much, much more than a dollar you'll receive 100 years down the track. Right? So we all intuitively understand this concept. They say you're interviewing housemates, they both offer the same rent. One of them says they'll pay monthly in advance, the other one says they'll start paying you 10 years down the track. We know that one of these is worth more than the other, right? That's the time value of money. So, economists whose job it is to figure these things out have found time and time again that 25 years of exclusive rights is more than ample to incentivize even the most lavish investments. So the prospect of rights to be enjoyed more than 25 years from now adds basically zero incentive to someone deciding whether to make an investment today. So to the extent that copyright lasts longer than that, it has to be justified on other grounds. Other incentive arguments have been put forward to do so. And most particularly, it's been argued that cultural intermediaries will not invest in making works available unless they've got exclusive rights over them. So in other words, that works in the public domain will be less available and subject to less investment than works that are covered by copyright. And if this was correct, then it would justify longer terms because our access aim here is to make sure that the works are available. But the evidence doesn't support that claim. Every published study to have tested this so far has found the opposite that works under copyright are in fact less available and receive less investment than similar works that are in the public domain. One of the most striking findings, I think, was from this study by Paul Heald. And he examined the availability of books by age on Amazon. What he found was that availability dropped sharply soon after release, and then it spikes again as the books enter the public domain. And maybe most remarkably, what he found is that more books were published in the 1880s than were originally published in the 1980s, found on Amazon. 
So until recently, all of the studies to have tested this underuse hypothesis had been carried out in the US context. And because they focused on availability within a single jurisdiction, it meant they could only compare availability of similar works, not identical ones. So pre-1923 works, post-1923 works. But my team just recently finished the first international study to analyze availability by copyright status. And what we did was compare availability of ebooks to public libraries across Australia, New Zealand, the US, and Canada. And we used data from Overdrive. Does anyone read library books via Overdrive? A few of you, absolutely you should, it's a great service. Uh, Overdrive's the Amazon of library e-lending. You see there the kind of number of loans that we're talking about. It's got a catalog of over 3.3 million titles. Because we were looking at availability across countries with this data, we were able for the first time to compare availability of the same titles across places where the difference was just in their copyright status. So I just want to briefly explain some of our key results because they do shine some new light on this question of how well does copyright promote ongoing availability. What we did was identify all of the authors in the Oxford Companions to Literature who had died between 1962 and 1967. And we ended up with a whole bunch of notables like uh, Aldous Huxley, Sylvia Plath, C.S. Lewis, uh, and Ian Fleming. All of their books were in the public domain in New Zealand and Canada. They were all under copyright in Australia, and they had a mix of statuses depending on whether they'd initially been renewed in the US. So that gave us ideal conditions for a natural experiment. If the underused hypothesis was correct, then those titles ought to be available at higher rates where they were under copyright than where they were in the public domain. So what did we find? Well, first of all, more than half of these authors had zero ebooks available for libraries to license in any of those four jurisdictions, regardless of their copyright status. And where books were available, it tended to be just the few most valuable titles from each author. So T.S. Eliot has maybe 80 publications, and we found just five available in any one country. Our second finding was that books were much more available in the public, where they were in the public domain than where they were under copyright. And the reason we were able to work out that there might be a causal effect here is because we had previously done a much larger study, also from Overdrive data, on 100,000 books. And that acted as a control sample. It gave us the baseline similarities that we could expect to find between Australia and New Zealand and between the US and Canada. And so we, as you see, there was a 99.7% crossover in the books that were available in that huge data set in Australia and New Zealand, and a 97.6% crossover for the US and Canada. So to the extent that we detected greater or smaller differences than that, it meant that we could be more persuaded that they were likely due to the difference in copyright status. So let's have a look at what we found. First of all, this marks in blue, they show you what we found in the control sample. So you see a big similarity, first of all, between the Canada and the US. Canada had 0.6 of a percent more books. And then in the public domain sample, it had a massive 15% more titles. New Zealand had 0.7 yeah, of a percent a smidgen, we might call it, uh, more titles than Australia, and then 5.6% more for the public domain sample. But most striking maybe is what we get when we compare New Zealand to the United States. Because in the control sample, we can see that New Zealand has far fewer books, 10.5% fewer books than the United States. But then when we look at the public domain sample, 11.7% more. So New Zealand libraries have access to way more books by these culturally important authors than US public libraries, even though its book market is just 1% of the size. So although publishers could charge more for the, copy, the books that were under copyright, and indeed we found they were doing that, and the differences far exceeded any amount that would be payable in royalties, they were still investing less and providing worse access where they were under copyright than when they were in the public domain. So this new study adds to the evidence that the commercial life of works can end much earlier than their cultural lives. And 
together with all of those other studies to have tested the underuse hypothesis, it tells us that just because someone controls the rights doesn't mean that they'll actually exploit them. So copyright can be counterproductive to our access aims. It can actually stand in the way of works being made available. Now, there may well be rationales that justify copyright being applied anyway, but the key here is just that they can't be justified on copyright's access aims. There's a couple of other incentives arguments too I don't have time to go into here, made in support of longer terms. You can read about those in the, longer pa in, in the written paper, but the upshot is they don't provide grounds for longer terms either. So in some, none of copyright's incentives arguments justify a term of longer than 25 years. So if copyright was purely utilitarian in nature, there wouldn't be a justification for it to last longer than that. But as I explained, it's not, right? We've also got those powerful rewards motivations that justify creators getting more than the minimum necessary to incentivize their investments, right? So that justifies longer terms. The problem is that under current arrangements, much of that rewards share tends to end up in other people's pockets. Rational investors don't limit themselves to the minimum necessary to incentivize their investments. They take everything they can get. To the point where your standard form Hollywood contract takes rights not just forever uh, and in whole, and not just on planet Earth, but also throughout the universe at large. So if a lucrative extraterrestrial market does exist uh, or emerge at some point, it's still not going to be the artists who get rich. So on this planet, I regularly see contracts where investors have taken the whole copyright or the lion's share of it for the entire term of copyright. And creators rarely have any genuine choice about signing that over thanks to the structural design and competitive realities of cultural labor markets, which have been very well documented in the field of cultural economics. Those long copyright contracts are problematic on both incentives grounds and rewards grounds. All right, first because, as we've already seen, just because someone holds the rights to the work doesn't mean they'll actually exploit it. And in fact, they might actually be getting in the way of somebody else doing so. So lengthy licenses can make it harder for creators to financially benefit from their works if they're not being exploited. And at the same time, they can interfere with society's broader access aims. But they're also problematic because authors' interests and investors' interests don't always align. They're so often conflated, conflated, but they do diverge, and that divergence tends to grow bigger as works grow older. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that by telling you a little bit more about that study of 100,000 books. Books depreciate really quickly. So most of them, their commercial life is over in a year, right? nearly all of them in five years. And we wanted to understand how that cultural depreciation was affecting the terms on which publishers were licensing them to libraries. And so we wrote an algorithm that estimated the original publication year for those 100,000 books using data that we pulled from Goodreads. And then we analyzed how publishers were licensing and pricing the older titles compared to the newer ones. And so what we discovered is that older titles are licensed on very similar terms to the newest ones. So what you're seeing here is our results about how books are licensed by age and license type. And the three colored lines through the, show the three main different license type. And the one we're actually most interested in and concerned by is that pink line. Those are time limited or exploding licenses. Those are books that are available to libraries for one year or two years. And after that, they explode. They're deleted from the collection, even if nobody ever borrowed them. And some of you might have heard that there's been a lot of developments in the last few weeks, few months, where uh, most of the big five publishers have now moved their entire catalogs to these exploding licenses. So what we're seeing here is for the books that are in copyright. And what we see is that the licenses are applied at about the same rate to the older and the newer books, despite the fact that the older ones are likely to have just a fraction of the demand. And we similarly found that there was no relationship between price and age 
except again for those very old books that are in the public domain, which were much, much cheaper. And in fact, one of our other really interesting findings in this research was when we tried to figure out well, what, what did impact the prices that the publishers set. And so we used uh, machine learning, we learned a regression tree, and we wanted to figure out the relationship between price and all of the other characteristics of the book. And do you know what we found? Again, except for those oldest works that are in the public domain, there is no relationship except the name of the publisher. And what that tells us is that the prices are being set completely at the publisher's whim without regard to the value of the book. So, publishers are licensing and pricing older books on the same terms as the very newest. That's problematic for our access aims, our incentives aims, because it means that libraries are less able to include certain kinds of books in their collections. And we've empirically confirmed this with a nationwide study that we just ran with all of the libraries in Australia. They have told us that this means that they can only buy certain kinds of books, the blockbuster titles that they know will circulate, and they certainly can't be spending a lot of money on these exploding licenses, even if it might be good to hold that book in their collection, if they know it's not going to circulate. So problematic for our access aims, but it's problematic for our rewards aims as well. Right? And this is where we can start to see how publishers' interests or investors' interests and creators' interests diverge. So let's think about what is the publisher's interest here? They're interested in maximizing their overall share of library collections budgets. Yeah? They don't have an interest in maximizing the income of any given author. And they don't have an interest in ensuring any given book continue to be read. But the author's interest is really different. They do want to maximize their own income. And they do want their books to continue to be accessible, available, and read. And so if the author was to control her own rights for her older books, she might license them and price them on very different terms to what we see the publishers are doing now in order to help further those interests. So we can see from this example that after a certain point of time at least, a license or an assignment can really start to work against the author's interest. And we know as well, of course, that long copyright grants can lead to a concentration of rights ownership that can make it harder for new distribution models to emerge, as well as a general lack of competition, and those things also make it harder for creators to get paid. So a big chunk of each copyright is justified as being only about rewarding creators, but as matters now stand, those rewards are overwhelmingly captured by owners instead. And so this is important to bring to mind when we hear pro-author rhetoric being used in the copyright discourse. We need to more critically challenge those claims, because very often, Proposed new rights or fights against exceptions will benefit creators only on the most threadbare theories of trickle-down economics. So if we're serious about supporting creators, we need to stop allowing their interests to be co-opted for the disproportionate benefit of others. So to sum up how well do I think current approaches are working out for us, well, we're paying far too much than we need to incentivize initial production, that's actually getting in the way of us uh, incentivizing ongoing investment in uh, access and availability. And that overpayment can't be justified as being about rewarding creators because overwhelmingly uh, that money is going to others in the value chain. Or it's simply going to waste because of rights being tied up with those who are not interested in exploiting them. And that waste speaks to the fact that the overwhelming majority of copyrights are of too little individual value to be worth exploiting. All right, how many copyrights do you reckon you own? I try to add mine up sometimes for fun when I'm going to sleep. I reckon a million. I like to take selfies for tourists, uh, out pictures for tourists, because I've, I've got about 500 of those copyrights. But they, they really add up. Uh, and of course, I'm not interested in exploiting those. There's all kinds of other stuff as well, and there's much more valuable things than that that are still not worth exploiting. And that gives us a classic collective action problem, right? Because while they're not worth very much individually, collectively, the lost value to society 
is enormous. So once we move away from that flawed creators versus users framing, and we actually measure current performance against intended aims, it becomes clear that we're paying a lot in exchange for very little. And a root cause of these problems, in my view, is that we award copyright in a lump sum, paid upfront in exchange for all the things that we hope it will do, but regardless of whether it actually will. You wouldn't buy a car at a price that factors in a century of ongoing maintenance, right, and with no obligation for them to actually provide it. But that's basically what we're doing with copyright. And the key to solving these problems, I think, is to be much cleverer about the ownership of rights. Instead of paying by in, by in a lump, front, lump sum upfront, we need to pay by installments instead. And we can achieve this by returning rights more cleverly to authors. So more than half the world's nations already have some kind of reversion right. Of course, you've got one here after 25 years. Um, Canada has one 25 years after the author dies. But these systems were designed before the digital era, and they don't take account the possibilities we have today for a very different kind of copyright bargain. Canada has just put forward uh, one reform. They've suggested uh, adding a reversion law so that rights go back to authors after 25 years. It works a lot like the US one, although hopefully with fewer hoops to jump through, 25 years instead of 35. Uh, but I don't think this does enough to fix what needs fixing. Right? Better than current arrangements, but it doesn't go far enough. Um, because it wouldn't be automatic, it would have the same problem as the US law, I think, which is that it would disproportionately benefit those most lucrative and successful works. It wouldn't do anything to help us with our collective action problem. Uh, and for the same reason, it wouldn't do much to help us improve creators' bargaining power because the bulk of the rights would continue to stay with the biggest investors who would continue to rule the creative industries. There wouldn't be potential for them to be freed up in the event that those companies were no longer doing the best job. So I think we can go further. I think we can design a new copyright bargain that maintains incentives while doing a much better job of facilitating access and getting creators paid. All right, so it's a big claim. In the time I've got left, I'm going to sketch out one alternative. There's a whole bunch of ways that we could do this if we started thinking about what we actually want copyright to achieve and how best to do so, but this is just one. And this version I'm going to sketch is fully compliant with the Burn and Trips treaties. They do place certain hard limits on our opportunities for reform. So copyright has to last at least life plus 50, for example. There can't be formalities on copyright's enjoyment and exercise. But they do leave us with some important wriggle room. So first, they're silent on ownership of rights. And second, while they prohibit some formalities, they don't, permit, they don't prohibit formalities on transfers of ownership. Third, nations don't have to comply with the treaties for works first published within their own borders, only for works published in other member states. So they can take the front door out. Now, it's long been assumed that countries wouldn't domestically depart from the copyright treaties on the basis that that would mean treating authors, domestic authors, worse than foreign authors. But I think we've reached a point, actually, where things have changed so much that we can turn that assumption on its head. So we've already seen that long copyright licenses, for example, can really harm creators' interests. And if that can only be fixed in a way that involves domestic departure from the treaties, then that's an option that's on the table. All right? So it's a bit of extra wriggle room that we have if we're thinking about how best to achieve copyright aims. So just some caveats before I sketch out this alternative because you're probably already going to tar and feather me during the discussion. I wouldn't propose this for large collaborative works like movies. I wouldn't propose it for works uh, created in the course of employment. They raise very different issues. But for other works, have a think about this. All right, so we know that 25 years of exclusivity is enough to incentivize even the biggest investments. So we could start by limiting transfers and exclusive licenses to a maximum of 25 years. And we could require those ownership transfers to be registered so that we know when they end and to facilitate licensing. 
then once the license or transfers expire, rights would return to their creators, who could use them any way they wanted, including by licensing immediately back to the exact same investor if they were the one that was doing the best job. But they might also go with a different business model or they might directly exploit the work themselves. If the parties wanted to engage in an additional investment and there wasn't enough time left on the original 25-year transfer, no problem. They could mutually agree to dissolve that one, enter into a new deal for 25 years. But the core of this is that you couldn't have a transfer, any one transfer that lasted more than 25 years, and you couldn't transfer works in advance. So this kind of wholesale reversion would maintain incentives for initial production, but it would also free up rights to new investments by people who did want to invest in them. And it would give authors and creators the opportunity to capture a bigger share of the rewards. And because rights would revert wholesale instead of on an individual case-by-case -case basis, there would be a real chance for new business models to emerge if the old ones were no longer doing the best job. But we can take it much further than that. I've been talking about two problems here. There's not enough money to pay creators, and there's too much money being left on the table by all of these rights that are going unexploited. So we have not enough money, and we have too much money. All right, the framing is suggestive. One of these problems can help solve the other. And Victor Hugo had a similar idea back in 1878. He wanted publishers to share their revenues more fairly with authors' heirs. And actually, he wasn't so interested in what he called the heirs of the blood. He was primarily interested in the heirs of the spirit. Right? He proposed that publishers should put some part of their revenues towards nourishing new generations of writers. So we could do something similar as part of a new copyright bargain. I've, I've already talked about registering transfers, which we could do for all authors consistent with the treaties. But for local authors, we can take it further. We could ask them to register their continuing interest in all works after, say, 25 years. That would give us a central registry, which could be used to, again, facilitate licensing and access. And we could use that registration process to facilitate new investment opportunities. So for example, you've got a book author, the rights have come back to them, they're still interested, they register it, and they have the opportunity to, with the click of a button, license it into a digital public library in exchange for per loan remuneration every time it's lent out. So there's all kinds of opportunities that would be, arise from that. And you could just rinse and repeat with authors continuing to have full rights in their works as long as they registered every 25 years. But what about all of those local works that weren't registered, right? which would be nearly all of them? All those forgotten books and music and paintings and sculptures and ephemera, the photographs, the computer programs, the maps, just about everything that was locally made at least 25 years old and doesn't appear on the registry. All the stuff that's at the heart of our collective action problem. I'd propose that all of those works, all of those published works that were not registered, be looked after by a cultural steward tasked with preserving them, licensing them, and promoting access. And then there's heaps of uses those works could be put to with a simple licensing structure. They could be bulk licensed to universities and schools, to cultural organizations. They could go into that digital public library. Right? They could be licensed by creators for remixing and reusing in new works. And of course, if at any point a creator wanted to reclaim a work that had made its way into that author's domain, maybe because it had found a new audience through that access, then they could do so at any time. So I'd ask creators to agree to a new bargain, one that asked them to just jump the minimal hurdle of acknowledging that they had an ongoing interest in their works once every quarter century. But what would they get in exchange? I would propose that all of that money, after costs, that came from reclaiming the culture in which owners were no longer interested, would go directly towards supporting authorship in the form of fellowships and grants and prizes. So we could generate new revenue for creators by reclaiming lots of that lost culture. And so we can see how this kind of alternative copyright bargain takes advantage of copyright's non-zero-sum nature. 
By changing the scope of rights, creators could win new revenue that's simply not possible now, right? just doesn't exist. And we could fund this through uses that are also impossible because the transaction costs are so high. And at the same time, we'd reclaim lots of the culture that's lost under current approaches. So this talk has really just been to make the point that we don't have to put up with our current copyright bargain and all of the collateral damage that it brings. We can create a new one that better supports creators, that promotes availability and access. And we can't just say, ah, oh, but the treaties don't let us do it because there is some wriggle room. And the individual elements in this alternative are not radical. It's 2019, we register for everything. We registered for this talk. Uh, authors already have time-based reversion rights in lots of countries, including this one. The opportunity we have is to combine these existing elements to affect meaningful change. So we already have everything that we need for a new copyright bargain. We just have to design it to do so. Thank you. I could jack in the box, but I did drop all of my papers in between. minutes and respond. This is a this is a, a, a very, very inspiring and challenging set of proposals based on a remarkably encouraging set of new evidence. I, I want to say that, that in a way the, the outcome of these analyses with respect to the the so-called underuse hypothesis doesn't surprise me. They, they, they correspond, I think, to both common sense expectations on the one hand and also to historical evidence on the other. I, I brought with me for, for show and tell. I have no nice slides, but I do have an 1891 edition of the Mysterious Mrs. Wilkinson by W. E. Norris from the Seaside Library of George Monroe, who was one of the great uh, pirate publishers of the 19th century. And the fascinating thing to look at in this book is not so much the story of the Mysterious Mrs. Wilkinson, such as it is, but the list of titles at the rear which indicate the amazing range of both common and obscure fiction that was available to American readers on the eve of the coming of international copyright because those works were in the US public domain. Far from encouraging or discouraging usage, it's absolutely clear that public domain status had the effect of increasing the number, the scope, and the reach of works that were made publicly available. And there's no reason to think that that should have changed over time, although it's delightful to hear, in fact, that it has not. Uh, I'm also delighted to hear the, the bargain word again because um, that at one time was a very important part of the, the, the sort of the rhetorical equipment of those of us who tried in the, in the, in the over the years of, of relentless copyright expansion in the United States to, to make the argument that that expansion should be somehow checked or limited or restrained. The trouble was, and I remember this vividly from the years of, of controversy over the last copyright term extension, the Sunday morning bill of, of, of 1998, 
that when we dusted off the bargain rhetoric, it didn't really work very well. First of all, some of the, some of the, the concepts of a bargain had been undermined over, cop, over time by elements and features of copyright reform, which the, the decision in, in the 1976 Copyright Act to make copyright effective as of the date of fixation rather than publication was probably the most significant. And more, more to the point, the, the idea of the bargain didn't comport very well with, with contemporary policymakers, contemporary, that is, to the mid-1990s, ideas about the enterprise in which they were engaged. A bargain between who and who is, I think, a question that was asked then and to which we didn't unfortunately have a good or a persuasive answer. And I think that question still, to some extent, uh, shadows this proposal. In other words, the, con the old concept of the bargain, the one that had, had sort of worn away to being more or less ineffective by the mid-90s was the idea of a, a grand bargain between the maker and the public, the maker to disclose and receive a limited term of protection, and the public to enjoy the immediate benefit of that work's availability on the terms stated by the copyright owner and its subsequent availability in the public domain. And so half of that bargain was in fact the, the personified or the embodied or the represented public. And it seems to me that in the presentation of this uh, new bargain and the, 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 the sort of the early elimination of the, the user as an, as an important actor in the process of bargain striking, there, there's a lingering question. I'll be interested to, to see what you have to say about it, Rebecca, about who is bargaining with whom in this situation, or is bargain simply a metaphor, a good metaphor perhaps, but a metaphor nonetheless for a, a, a generally attractive public policy solution. If there is a bargain, a true bargain involved, a bargain, and it seems to me that at some, in some sense there must be, because in order for any, any compromise of this kind to be enacted, it would have to be supported by representatives of the, the, the those who, who represent the public interest and access on the one hand, and those who represent the interests of creators on the other will assume for the moment that even though they probably hold most of the political cards, the middlemen, the publishers, and their, their ilk can somehow be read out of the bargaining process. Even so, you've got two parties who need to participate. There would be difficulties in the United States. And one of the difficulties in the United States, which is not perhaps insuperable, but needs to be recognized, is that anyone who purported in, to, to speak for the public interest in access to knowledge in this, in this, in, in, a, in a, a participating in the formation of such a bargain would be required to concede immediately something that public interest advocates or public access advocates in the United States have never conceded, and that is that the, the reward function of copyright is a legitimate function. You may be correct that it is so and is universally recognized as so, but it has not been recognized as such here. Perhaps that's why we are awash in purple liquid in the United States, but nevertheless, we haven't ever conceded that there is anything to the copyright bargain except the appropriate incentive, whether to creators or perhaps to distributors, 
So that would be a major, I was listening to the radio today about the, the negotiation, the US negotiations in the, with the Taliban, where, where it seems that we have to make most of our, our concessions first in order to be able to talk. Um, there, would be, there would be hard bargaining. It would be hard, I think, to convince public interest advocates in the United States to enter into a discussion of a new bargain premised on the notion or premised on a concession that authors had inherent natural entitlements to reward. You might be able to do it, but I think it would be difficult. And on the other side, I had all, I'm also skeptical. If there is real bargaining to be done here as distinct from simply the, the imposition of, a, of an attractive overall public policy solution, and that is that I am after a, a professional lifetime in this field, deeply skeptical that those who represent authors as distinct from authors themselves could ever be persuaded to recast their vision of the good so radically as to be willing to accept this new bargain. It seems to me that all the indications we have so far suggest the opposite. So I'll be, we'll be very curious to hear whether there's, there's your thoughts about whether there is, there's really any reason to suppose that although conceivably the end beneficiaries of this ought to like it on the author side, any reason to suppose that the entities and organizations that represent those authors actively would be in fact interested in engaging in this grand negotiation. Finally, a cautionary, something which I didn't see dealt with much in the articles and that for various reasons concerns me a good deal. And that is that in this, in this, in this complex but very rational pattern of grants and reversions and re-grants and reclaimed grants, I am concerned about how one would deal with the issue of uh, derivative works. I'm concerned about how as the, the rights to, to underlying works move back and forth between original grantee and author, and then perhaps into the management of a public custodian and upon demand back to an author or an author's successor from the public custodian. How does one deal with all of the material that is made in reliance on various arrangements, either privately negotiated or, or publicly regulated, so as to assure that the heritage of derivative material isn't placed in a in a in a kind of uh, a kind of uh, vice grip of conflicting rights. And again, uh, something something to think about and something to address. But this, it, I'm really interested in hearing answers and responses as I'm interested in hearing questions of others. So I'm almost ready to stop. But one thing I've got to do, it's a plug and I, 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 I have to make it. In the, in the VLA article, there's a fascinating example on the topic of orphan works of the problems that developed in New Zealand when an effort was made to do software preservation of relatively recent, but not necessarily commercially active or valuable computer programs. And I, I, the, the plug is this, there isn't, there's a fix for that. And the fix is fair use. And if anyone is interested in the fix, you ought to look at the website of the Software Preservation Network, conveniently, www.softwarepreservationnetwork.org, where a relatively new set of fair use best practices for software preservation have been posted, which are designed to deal 
with those specific instances. I realized that's it's not integral to the proposal, but I had to get the plug in anyway. So uh, thank you, and I look forward. So we're going to do Q and A. Do you want to? Can I respond quickly yes. to yeah, some please. of the 